Well, good day, everyone. Uh, I hope you've had a, a good week, a blessed week, and uh, I I have. Uh, every week's a blessed week. Uh, some are just a little more blessed than others, I guess. Uh, we're still undergoing the election, and the virus is raising its head again. Uh, states are shutting down. Uh, yesterday, uh, our governor has put uh, into motion uh, where restaurants and uh, bars and facilities uh, aren't closed. We're not doing a total shutdown, but uh, they have to be closed earlier. I believe said 10 o'clock. So he's putting a curfew into motion. Uh, a lot of people sick, uh, people with the virus that we need to be praying for. Uh, of course, it's the time of season that the flu uh, starts up and uh, there are people that don't have the virus but have the flu. Uh, so there's a lot of, and you have friends and family probably that are experiencing illnesses and that you need to pray for. And uh, we need to be diligent in our prayers. There's power in prayer. And, uh, you know, conversing with God, that's what prayer is, just having conversation with God and how important that is. Well, last week we started on a little series, Who is Jesus? Who is he? The Christ the Messiah. Uh, what is our relationship? What is it to be? What is it now? And, uh, you know, we started last week and I want to go back again this week uh, to uh, chapter 16 of Matthew when Jesus came to his beloved disciples and he said, uh, now when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who is this community say that I am? Uh, and then they answered, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he said to them, looking intently upon each one of the disciples, and he says, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, without hesitation, responded and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Oh, how important it is. What a powerful verse that is. If you don't have that highlighted in your Bible, uh, if you don't have a mark on it, if you don't have it underlined, uh, boy, do that. Mark that, that Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We need to have that knowledge in our being, not just in our minds, which is important to have it in our minds to know that we know, but it's to be in our being, into our soul, into our spirit, into our heart, that we know that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. And then Jesus went on and uh, he said, uh, blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied are you, Simon, Barjona, for thou has not, for, blood, for flesh and blood, men has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, Petro, a piece of the rock, that's what Peter means, a piece of the rock. Uh, I will build my church and upon the gates of hell and the powers of the infernal shall not overpower it. For be strong to be determined or to hold it. Uh, there at the beginning of 18, I tell you, Peter, a piece of the rock, and upon this rock, and that's two different rocks. P 
Peter is a smaller rock. It's a piece of the big rock. It's like uh, the rock of Gibraltar, that huge entrance into the Mediterranean Sea. And a piece of that rock, that huge rock, and a piece of that would be Peter. But the rock itself is what Christ says upon this rock, the big rock, the knowledge that Peter spoke. Not many times we read that and we think that the church is going to be built upon Peter, that Peter's the Pope, so to speak. And the Catholic Church believed that the Pope is, is a Peter. And, but that's not what Christ was saying. He said, Peter, you're a smaller rock. And upon the huge rock, that rock of your knowledge, knowing that I am the Son of the living God. And Christ may have even gestured to himself, upon this rock, this knowledge that you have of me, then I will build the church. And how important that is to, for us to have that fundamental understanding that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon that knowledge, the church was to be built and has been built and continues to grow on that knowledge that he is the Christ and how important that is. And, you know, in Matthew 20, 27, I want to go there in just a little bit, that, that we'll read as Christ goes to the cross. Uh, you know, what would we say is our greatest thing to achieve? To sit back and to think over your life. What have you achieved? What is your greatest achievement? Some men would say, well, I, I, I have achieved uh, great wealth. I have millions of dollars, some even billions of dollars today. I have achieved uh, power. Uh, I'm the CEO of a great company. Uh, you know, many things that we could say. Uh, I've, you know, in the music world, I've sold many albums and uh, have been number one on the music chart. Uh, many things that we have achieved. And in our own lives, there may have been uh, relationships, your marriage, you've been married for a number of years and you, and you have a great relationship. Uh, that's something that you've achieved, that's great. Uh, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, uh, you know, accomplishments that we can look back over our lives are great things. But what is the greatest achievement that anyone can, can achieve? What is the greatest? Well, I think without hesitation that we must say salvation. Salvation, a free gift. And when we put forth the effort of asking forgiveness of our sins, when we get to a point that we realize that we are a sinner, we have messed up, and we need to change our lives. I don't know if I'm going to go to heaven. I don't know what's going to happen when I die. But then when we come to that point and we realize that we have to turn from our wicked ways and we ask Jesus to Christ to forgive us of our sins, and he does, and then we ask him to come into our life, is that not the greatest achievement that we can achieve and how important that is but can there be anything else can there be I mean once we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior 
and to know that we're heaven bound. And First John 5.13 it says, These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. To achieve the faith, to achieve the knowledge, to know that you've accepted Christ into your life and that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and that you have eternal life to be in heaven forever and ever and ever. What a great thing that is. What more could there be? I mean, can there be any more? I mean, is that, is that the greatest? Yeah, it is. I mean, that is the greatest, but there's more. For you see, that's just the opening of the door to what God has for us. You see, God put into motion of Christ going to the cross. Way back in Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15, when Adam and Eve fell, when they sinned, God put into motion that there would be a Savior come, that he would be the seed of a woman, Mary birthing Jesus, Jesus the Christ, that there would be a division between Satan and Mary, and Satan and the seed, and that, would, that conflict would go on and on and on, the conflict of evil, the conflict of good. And, and it said there in three, uh, chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 15, that this evil force, this serpent, Satan, would bruise the heel of the seed, Jesus the Christ. But that seed, Jesus the Christ, would bruise the head of the serpent. A picture of Christ going to the cross and being victorious over death. How important that is. But what, what is there the more of after salvation? I mean, that's the opening of the door to have a relationship. To have a relationship with God Almighty. To have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Having a relationship with Jesus the Christ. The Word. The truth. To, to have an intimate relationship. Not just a casual relationship, but to have an eternal, personal, intimate relationship with the three in one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God so loved his children. He so much desired to have a relationship with us that he put into motion what had to happen for us to have an intimate relationship with him. Now, let's look this morning in Matthew 27, starting with verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, which was about noon, there was a darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, till about three o'clock. So from noon to about three o'clock, there was a darkness that fell upon the earth. This was after Christ was arrested, beaten, his back shredded as he took the beating from the 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 whips, the cat of nine lives, took that terrible beating. And then 
carrying the cross down the Via Della Rosa and then taking the path up to Golgotha to the top and then thrown upon a cross upon the ground and nailed to that cross. Nails going into his wrists upon the cross. His feet nailed to that cross and then lifted up and that cross dropped into a hole in the ground. And the shake that that cross would have had as he hung on that cross and the tearing of his wrists, of his feet. The physical, physical pain that he experienced as he hung on that cross. The physical pain that he experienced as he was beaten, as he was spit upon, as the crown of thorns pressed into his scalp. And as he hung there on that cross, there was a darkness that fell upon the earth. And I believe that it was a darkness, what I call a heavy dark. It was a darkness that you could feel pressing in upon you. It may have been so dark that you could hardly see the hand in front of you. And that darkness fell upon the earth. And about the ninth hour, about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Labama Savakthani. And what was that? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why hast thou abandoned me, leaving me helpless, forsaking and failing me in my time of need? Jesus Christ said, to his disciples and to others, I will never leave you or forsake you. God said that the Father and I are one. And yet, in his worst time, as he hung on that cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I can't imagine I've experienced pains, I've had heart attacks, I've had great chest pressures, I've had great pain. My second heart attack, they kept asking me, from 1 to 10, what is your pain level? And I would say 13 to 15, it was well over 10. I've had back sciatic nerve problems, pain, but I've never had my back shredded beaten, spit upon. Although I did in Israel have yogurt thrown at me and had a rotten banana th thrown hit me in the back. Uh, you know, but nothing like Jesus had. Martyrs, people that have uh, been martyred for Christ, that have been beaten, that have been beheaded, that have been burned at the stake, tortured in terrible ways because they wouldn't, would not denounce Jesus as being Christ. I've never experienced some of that. I never experienced the physical pain that Jesus experienced. I can imagine a little bit what that pain would have been because I have experienced physical pain. For him to experience that and then to be hung on that cross, crucified, nailed to that terrible, terrible cross, and then to cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The pain that Jesus the Christ suffered on the cross was more than the physical pain. For you see, 
as he went to that cross, he took my sins. He took your sins. He took the sins of the world upon himself. The, the, the pain, not just physical pain, but the spiritual pain, the soul pain that he must have experienced as he took the sins, the human side of Jesus couldn't have bore that. The human side of the Jesus bore the physical pain. But to take the sins of the world, to take upon himself your sins and my sins, that was Christ. Jesus, the Christ, took those sins. And then when he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When he cried those words out, the earth shook. There was an earthquake to the magnitude that it opened tombs. And the saints, the old saints that had died, that were buried in the tombs, came out and they walked this earth. A resurrection happened when Christ hung on that cross. And at that moment, I believe, the veil in the temple that shrouded the entrance into the Holy of Holies, that veil was torn from not bottom up, but from the top down. God tore that veil allowing us access into the Holy of Holies. No longer did we have to have a single high priest once a year to go in for the remissions of our sins. But Christ, being of the order of Melchizedek, the high priest, became that high priest, became the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. But why did Jesus cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God had to turn his eyes off of Jesus because of the sins. Jesus took those upon himself. Jesus' faith never failed. Even though he cried out, why have you forsaken me? He cried out, my God, my God. That shows the faith that Jesus the Christ had. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? God, Jesus the Christ, never wavered in his faith. But just for that moment, God had to turn away. And then he turned back. And then Christ cried out, it is finished. It has now come to completion. Father, that which we had planned at the beginning, what had been put into motion for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years, now has come to completion. I have come to the cross. I have been willing to be obedient to your plan, to carry it out in complete detail, to give my life, to give myself for the remissions of sin. Romans 6, 23. The price, the penalty, the wages of sin is death. Christ died for you and for me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16. How important, important that is. And Christ paid that penalty for sin. He died for us. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus the Christ, our Messiah. But why? Why was Jesus willing to do that? Why did God put into motion at the beginning with Adam and Eve? Well, let's go back and let, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26. Let us make man in our image. God created mankind, created them, Adam and Eve, and told them to go forth and replenish the earth. Not Adam and Steve, but Adam and Eve to replenish the earth, to have children, to populate God's created earth to populate this world. And why? Why did God create them? Well, God walked with them. He talked with them. God had a relationship with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had a relationship with God, with their Creator, with their Heavenly Father. And our Heavenly Father so much wanted that relationship to continue to grow and grow and grow. Not just with Adam and Eve, but that relationship was to grow in all of their descendants, all of their children, and their children's children, and their children's children, even to you and I, and for the you and I's that are yet to come. God wants a relationship with His created human beings, a spatial relationship. So He put into motion that Christ that has always existed, the Word, was to come to this earth, to be born into a human being, to become flesh and blood, to become Emmanuel, God with us, to be Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Savior of the people. And all that was to have a relationship with us. And there's a time coming, and I believe very soon, with all that's happening in the world today, and every day on the news, there's more happenings that are happening. We definitely, definitely are getting to the point that God's going to turn to His Son and say, Son, go get our children. Go get to church. It is time. It is finished. It was finished as Christ hung on the cross that He became the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And at that point, it was put into motion that He would come again. This Savior, this Messiah, this Christ would come again and receive His children and would take us out of this sin-ridden world to have an intimate relationship with Him that we have started to have here on earth that is, is to continue and to grow in the knowledge, to grow in the intensity, to grow in the love into the intimate relationship 
that we are to have for all of eternity. And then he comes for the church. And, and then the earth goes through that great tribulation for seven years. And then Christ and the believers come back to this earth and reign for a thousand years under the rule of Jesus the Christ. Under the authority of the spiritual truth. Under the love, under the magnitude of the love that the Father and Jesus has for us. And then that comes to an end. And then begins an eternity that encompasses everything. The heavens and the earth will melt away. A new heaven and a new earth will be created and everything will be eternal. There will be no more sin. There will be no more death. And why? Why? Because God loves you and loves me so much. He wants that intimate relationship. And we have a responsibility. God had a responsibility to fulfill all of his promises. God had a responsibility of the prophecy of Genesis 3.15 to fulfill that prophecy. God has a responsibility to fulfill the prophecy of the rapture of the church. God has the responsibility to fulfill the seven-year tri tribulation period. God has the responsibility to fulfill the promise of the thousand-year millennial reign. God has the responsibility to fulfill the prophecy of a new heaven and a new earth. Eternal. That's God's responsibilities. And he's fulfilled them and will fulfill them. But you and I have a responsibility to put forth the effort, your effort and my effort, to build our relationship with Jesus the Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and with God Almighty, our Heavenly Father. We have a responsibility to grow in that relationship. We have to put forth the effort. And one of the things that, that will help us to do that is to learn more who Jesus is, to learn more about him. Each day, we should have a goal of learning just one thing more about Jesus. And that will build our relationship. Yeah. Learning more about Jesus helps us learn more about God. Jesus loves you, and I do too. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for that powerful, powerful love that flows from you. And 1 John chapter 4 says, Love is of you. That love that is of you is that flowing love that just continually the flows from you, just like in an artesian well. That water just continues to bubble up out of the ground, just continues to flow and flow and flow. You are an artesian well of love. It just continues to flow and flow and flow because you are love and you love us so much and desire to have that intimate relationship with each and every one of us. Collectively, as a church, yes, we can love you collectively. But your love is even greater than that. It's an individual love. It's a personal love. A love that we can enjoy one-on-one -on -one 
Oh, how special that is. Help us, Lord. Encourage us. Strengthen us. That we can just continue to grow and grow and grow in you. We pray this in your precious name, Lord Jesus. You who are the Christ, our Messiah. Amen. Hope to see you next week. And remember, you are blessed by the best.